That was Landing Day from uh, the concert version of a new rock opera called One Way Trip to Mars that was performed in Bath this fall, 2016, and has been reworked into a full-length musical rock, rock opera that will be performed at the Waterville Opera House this August, August 24th through 27th, with a New York cast. And I have here with me uh, Peter Alexander and Johanna Harness, Harkness, Harkness, Harkness <laughs> who, is, uh, who are the composers of this, this fantastic new musical that's gotten the attention of uh, some celebrities at the uh, Space Center. Well, NASA knows about it, Boeing and Lockheed wow. Martin and all these folks know about it because we went down and performed some of the songs for a big conference wow. on the Expo uh, Humans to Mars conference. So it's, it's really become something very big with the New York cast and at the Waterville Opera House. How did this idea get started? I went out and sat down at the piano and wrote the first song, which is called It Catches Up To You. Um, but the reason I got inspired to write that song was because we've been hearing about the Mars One mission to send people to Mars. And I started thinking about the adventure of that, how exciting it would be to be the one going to Mars. And then I started thinking, wait a second, people all over the world are signing up to go and leaving their families and their children and their spouses. And I started to think of how it would be if you were the one left behind. And um, I had a lot of emotion around that. And so that's where I started with that perspective of a woman being left behind. And you were mentioning just before that it led to the creation of the last song. In yes, the and that is the, this, and the very last song is called It Catches Up To You. And um, that song inspired the rest. And uh, Peter then got excited about um, the idea and started writing um, songs from the perspective of the, the male perspective of using agency to go on this adventure and I started writing from the female perspective of, wait a second. <laughs> so. But the, It Catches Up With You was the original song that started this whole thing wrong. Right. Did you like yeah. to play a little bit of that? So now you, you said that you started thinking about this because of a very personal, you know, uh, some kind of connection to this whole idea of going off to Mars. Mm -hmm. So what was it like to write a musical where you have some of your own feelings, your, the re reality part of it, and then the science fiction part of it, blending those two together? Well, we actually explored the science fiction part and decided to jettison science fiction. 
uh, we, we actually, when we first started thinking about the rock opera, uh, we thought it can be a love story that's beyond time and face, space will be cryogenically frozen and, you know, they'll meet up some centuries later. And like then we decided, no, that's too complicated. Let's make it reality based. And there are real plans. NASA has plans to send people to Mars in 2033. Elon Musk with his SpaceX is trying to get people to Mars a lot sooner than that. Uh, I mean, these are real things that are happening in our society and in our culture. So we thought, let's write about the first mission, where the, the person is sent up to set up the infrastructure, but he's not going to be coming back. And uh, the story developed from there, and we went through a lot of different iterations and a lot of different plot ideas, and we sort of narrowed it down to something that actually could really, truly happen. So. There's a little bit of fantasy involved in it, too, because we, we have one character who is a flamenco dancer, and she is the personification of Mars. And um, so the idea was that she is this passionate, fiery character who um, seduces Mars, uh, power to Mars. And um, later, when we talked to about our director, he'll, um, Dennis St. Pierre, he really took our narrative and um, created a book so that it became musical theater. And it, it changed it from a concert with a story to uh, having a script and really being a rock opera. Now, I'm, I'm curious, when, when you did do the concert version, was there an intention to take it further, or was that just your right, your concept right from the beginning, and then then you you grew it into a, rock, a stage version? We kind of hoped it would go further, but the standing ovations at the end of each performance convinced us that we probably should. Um, but at that point, it was <laughs> it was um, a little bit narrow in terms of character development. We there was a lot of gaps in um, the the relationship between the two principal characters. There were other characters who had not yet been developed. And uh, that's when, when Dennis St. Pierre came in and joined us. Uh, he helped us develop a whole lot of new um, material. We actually started off with 18 songs, and now the rock opera has 28 songs, all original material. And those songs really delve deeply into four principal characters, plus the character of Mars, which is a, a principal character. And he helped us develop the idea of what Mars could actually be. At first, it was Johanna bringing in every imaginable cool thing that we could possibly get on the stage. I had a, I had a Scottish piper, <laughs> and somehow that made sense at the time. We had all kinds of stuff. We, we had different people come in and see different parts. Uh, Tim Goad, who's pretty well known in the back area, he has a video store out there, a very dynamic young guy, came in and he sang one song, and Naaman Johnson sang another. But it, it, um, when we actually sat down with Dennis, we crafted the thing into much more cohesive characters mm -hmm. and a much more cohesive in, in um, relationships. It made a lot more sense. He I helped have us to say that the, when um, the process of writing the whole thing was very inspired, and we were really just having fun and following our hearts um, while we were writing, and so it wasn't. It took a long time to develop it all, but it flowed. It yeah, things are really happening in a really wonderful way. But and for an example, Johanna and I were watching, after she wrote this, the, the first song, which we didn't know it was going to be a rock opera. We, we were watching, we were listening to something, um, some astronauts speaking about their experiences in space. And um, that literally, I, I started writing down the lyrics. And those became the lyrics of the next song and that we wrote. It's not the next song in the rock opera in terms of the progression of the songs, but it's the next song uh, we wrote. And again, it happened the way you know, honestly, it's it's just, I came up with this idea. <laughs> and it's just a rock and roll, strong rock and roll song. Uh, and it's all based on the lyrics of, of these astronauts who had these cosmic experiences going, stepping out onto the moon, being in space, looking around, feeling like we're all stardust. And there are such poetic words. I didn't make them up. We that created a little bit of connecting tissue. Well, we could play it right now? Yeah, do it right now. Okay. When I looked outside 
my window I was floating there in space The earth was small and lapis blue I felt so full of grace There are shooting stars beneath me And auroras dancing lights The cities in my distant world glow darkness of the night Oh yeah I can see it oh, yeah. Then I saw there's nothing random Every planet's in its place All the trouble in that natural world Is from the human race But there's challenge and confusion As I wonder what to say To share this revelation Maybe friends will come to listen So that, that was great that we got that from the Chocolate Church um, mm -hmm. concert version that we just heard, Space Journey. Now, my, my question is, you described how that you came up with the last song first, mm -hmm. and then you just played a riff from a song that you know, inspired you, mm -hmm. but you had the storyline already made out. Mm -hmm. How did you then you know, really develop the story with the songs, or okay. was the writing process? To the intersecting trajectories, uh, where these two, two people, and now there's a lot more people involved in it, but as with Dennis's help, we've made it a lot more complex and there's a, a lot more people that you can identify with. But we wanted to take it from, um, it's a human development story. The, Paolo goes from being kind of full of himself. He's like the top gun and he becomes very humble and very, uh, and the, the first start of that is in Space Journey when he starts experiencing the grandeur of the universe, as Johanna was just saying, and he's, that, like, oh my God, this is such a, an amazing place. And then he realizes all the troubles back on Earth were, are caused by the human race. <laughs> so uh, he goes, and eventually he gets out when he lands on Mars, and he's all there by himself. It's, it's a pretty scary and lonely experience, ultimately, for him. And then communication links go down. Meanwhile, Cassandra, back on Earth, is becoming more and more empowered. And oh, she is, I forgot. You should see his face. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but we wanted to catch this one song where uh, Cassandra and her best friend are, are talking about what it was like when he took off because, you know, they can see the face of the astronaut as he's going up. Oh, so, so they a song about seeing Johanna, his face and her reaction to it. Yeah, oh, that, this is a song about when he's about to take off or taking off and, and the, the, um, Cassandra is talking about We'll just uh, play a like. little part of it. Sure. Okay. Two, three... Str 
strapped him to the cockpit in his space suit all the instruments set into place So that was sort of like a song that's reflective of what's going on, right? In the, mm -hmm. so sort of, but uh, then you have to develop, since it's a rock opera, there's no actual just spoken word. You have to develop the plot with music. And do you have an example of a song that like sort of advances the plot of the the music? Um, Send off is a really good. Um, yeah. It's a pivotal song in the rock opera, uh, where. Um, the head of the space agency has made the decision that somebody has to go to join Paolo on Mars because all the systems on Earth are breaking down, there's nuclear terrorism going on, uh, global warming is causing catastrophic uh, breakdown of society. All fiction, of course. <laughs> Based on fiction. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Um, so he decides to send Cassandra, and in that song, he describes what's happening on Earth. There's fighting now in every country, people dying in the streets, missiles, bombs. Um, there is no more hope for peace. Um, we must send someone to Mars to join our captain there in space. Basically, it's like, this is our, maybe our chance to save the human race. It's that critical. And when he chooses Cassandra, she's sent off to space. So that's sort of the pivotal song in the, in the whole thing, where it tells a lot of the story in that one song. It sounds uh, very, uh, you know, has to be very energetic to, to carry all of that. Now you have a, you, you have a s sort of a small cast with this, don't you? You have to convey like this whole huge thing with this world crisis with a small cast. How do you do that? Well, there'll be 12 people on stage and we'll have an 11-piece orchestra in the pit. And there's a, what's really cool about this show, and Dennis can maybe talk about this later, um, we, Dennis and Chad Lefebvre and uh, Johanna and I uh, worked together to create a concept as a cinematic concept. Uh, so it's, it's not just the actors on stage and it's not static sets. There's cinema going on behind us. So when, when Paolo is flying through space, the audience is going through space too with a cinematic thing going on on this screen. Uh, a huge screen. It's not a little thing. It's like this is the theater. Not like this little uh, thing over here. Behind <laughs> us. The, some of these songs developed in very unusual ways. Some of them just came to us. They were like, boom, we woke up in the morning, or Johanna walked out into the studio and sat down and played, and all of a sudden there was a song. Uh, I think it's a lot more effortless for Johanna. Some of the songs were, uh, that I wrote were from musical themes that I had been working on, in some cases, for years. And uh, that song, Send Off, that I was just talking about, I wrote it years ago as a sort of a teenage love song. <laughs> <laughs> the year that I was 17, I was hungry, I was mean. I mean, it's like ridiculous, you know, like a who kind of rock and roll song. <clears throat> and then, um, uh, then I, when, when the Ukraine crisis happened, when, um, you know, what's, the, uh, what's his name? Yeah. The, the, the Russian favoring president of, of Ukraine was being ousted. I changed the song. I took that song and turned it into a, a thing we called Central City. Um, let's go down to the Central City. Let's go down to the Central City. People lying in the streets. And it was all about the forces of democracy coming up. 
Well, that's awfully political. But then when we started writing this rock opera, it, that we were so the music was so much fun to play, and it had such an energy to it that then we we transformed it into a version of send off. Uh, and the version that was played at the Chocolate Church actually then morphed again. Uh, so now we, that song has gone through four complete iterations, wow. four different lives. That and, was rare. Most mm -hmm. of them are fairly new, but this one had a shelf life. <laughs> yeah. Multiple shelves. <laughs> so at the very end of the first uh, act is send off, but just before that is uh, one of our characters is Madeline, and uh, we have a song called Night Blooming Sirius, and it's about, um, it's a metaphor, but the Night Blooming Sirius is a flower that blooms once a year, and it starts at night, at about midnight, and it opens up, and then it goes back down and it dies by morning. And so it's a bittersweet, it's the most intoxicating flower too. We were sitting on a porch once with several of them and we were just like all on catnip. It was, it was a really <laughs> amazing smell. And, and this flower just kind of stuck in my mind and I sat down one night and this song came. And then we met our Madeline, um, who is Nicole, um, Palmer, and so I'd like her to come up and sing Night Blooming Sirius, and our amazing accompanist, who's a great long-term friend of Nicole, Ray Bailey. Who is also our music director. Who's also our music director. So we're here with, uh, with Denis St-Pierre, who is the uh, director of this musical. And I just want to start off by asking you how you got started and what interests you in getting involved with uh, this uh, rock opera. It's kind of funny. Um, Peter, Johanna, and I in the past had worked on a uh, human trafficking artist confront trafficking event. And I had approached them to perform in it. And then um, for two years, we hadn't really spoken. They had mentioned something to me when we were doing this that oh, we're working on this new rock opera. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm out of the industry right now. I don't want anything to do with this right now. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, two years later, uh, we're on the street in Bath, and Cassandra, well, I now call her Cassandra. I can't help it, Johanna. But every time I, Johanna walks up to me, she goes, everybody's been telling us we should be talking to you. And I'm like, what about? <laughs> well, we did the rock opera concert. We're doing this rock opera and rock opera concert. And um, it just went really incredible, but we want to go a little further with it. And people are saying that we should talk to you. And I was game. Uh, I was unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Not that this is paying me anything. <laughs> um, Not, yet. Not yet, but it will. I, I'm confident of that. Um, and I was... 
I, I needed something to fill my soul again. Uh, I had been in the industry for over 20 years as an actor as well as profess, uh, professional singer and I've directed and so forth um, in New York and LA, but I got burnt out. Um, but that passion never left me and my soul just needed it again. And this just, they happened to come up to me at just the right time and uh, helped me find my way back. And uh, I can't express how gra grateful I am to them for that. Um, but they were really open to, to having me come and check it out. So I had a chance to watch the concert Oh, you did get uh, I didn't actual... see the concert live. I got to see it later. I have a five-year-old, so it's kind of hard. At the time, he was four-year-old. It's kind of hard to get out at night. Um, so I watched the video of it, and immediately I knew there was something there. Um, it, it reminded me of, like, Jethro Tull's Aqualung, hmm. you know, or um, uh, or a piece like that that's, you know, or Meat Loaf's Bat Out of Hell. Not that the music was similar, but the concept was there. It was very similar to like a con uh, concept album, which is what a lot of people think is rock opera. So it was already right there. Mm -hmm. And there was a thin narrative, not, not, not fully developed at all yet. Uh, only really two characters, and we really didn't get to know them a lot. Um, but there was a lot already there. There was the, the, the lyrics of the songs had a great deal of passion, incredibly good storytelling within the, in the lyrics. Um, and the, the whole concept of a rock opera based upon the journey to Mars really just hit me, you know, with everything that's going on. And um, Send Off was one of those songs that really put me over the edge, and so did Space Journey. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, when she sang You, Sh you Should Have Seen Her Face was another one. So there are, these, there are very strong elements there already written into it. Um, and I could easily see how this could be developed into a full rock opera where we develop the characters, we create a real narrative, um, we bring more characters into it so that we have more relationships. And um, a lot, not to make it a rock musical theater piece, which a lot of people also wonder, is that what this is? Well, musical theater still has script, it still has lines. Uh, what makes this truly a rock opera when we develop it for the stage is that it's all sung. There are no spoken words at mm -hmm. all. It's all sung, but it's developed with the same kind of ideas as an actual opera has. So the same kind of narrative is put in there. Uh, Ray could even attest to more of this. Uh, so it just has to have more storytelling. We have to know who these people were. We have to get a sense of who their past was, their relationships with each other as well as with other people. Um, and uh, I was excited that they were willing to listen to me a little bit and then write eight new songs. How, how was it for you two who had worked? You know, <laughs> Ten of course, new songs. You're working <laughs> so close together and you're inviting somebody else into the process. How, was the, how did that change the dynamics of your creative process? Um, it, it made, um, it was really the, what we needed to create some cohesiveness. We are songwriters, but we are not actors, and we are not, we certainly had never done a, any musical theater, or um, we thought we had a rock opera, but it, it was really a concert of rock songs that told a little bit of a story. Um, so what we seriously needed was uh, somebody in the business who was a professional who's done three million, you know, tours of Les Mis <laughs> as Jean Valjean, and um, who could bring that sensibility and that expertise um, to what we already had. So for us, it was a dream come true, really. Um, it, made, it made our dream realized. And it was uh, extremely welcomed and uh, a total gift. We have um, three type A personalities <laughs> right here and a whole bunch more in our circle. So uh, it, it has taken a little negotiating, but um, we all have a shared vision and we have enormous respect for each other's uh, talents and abilities and experience. And uh, Dennis never tried to take it away from us and say, you know, is his. He was always very um, giving and generous in his appraisal of what we had done. Yeah. And we feel the same way about what he brings to it. And um, Dennis has such a vast uh, experience and connections in, in the industry. 
we had no idea how to do auditions, for example, and um, he helped us set up auditions in New York, and uh, Nicole was very instrumental mm -hmm. in that too, mm -hmm. and we had over 200 people apply, uh, and we, we chose, what, 50 or 70 of them, and actually uh, met with them in New York City, and the people that we chose, every single one of them are so good that yeah. when they sang our songs, it literally brought tears to our eyes. Oh, it was so yeah. moving and so incredible. And everybody, Nicole, who is actually living in Maine now, she's one of the only people from Maine who's actually in this show. Well, no, Rennie. Rennie <laughs> and is, Rennie as and well as Mars. Our Rennie very as important Mars, Mars yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah. every single person in the cast has that charismatic uh, emotional power in the way they present themselves. So it seems like every addition of a person here mm -hmm. added to this and, yes. and sort of the synergy that you're talking about, yes. the creativity coming through you, not actually... And Dennis has been the ringleader in all of this, oh. and pulling all these incredible people together. He brought Chad Lefebvre in to help us uh, manifest the cinematic aspect of, of this show. Mm -hmm. So let him uh, introduce um, I Am Humanity. Yeah, so <laughs> you were talking earlier about um, the songs in the show that needed to fill some spaces. Well, uh, a lot of the pro a lot of the issues that we were facing is we didn't get enough knowledge about the characters themselves and their past or their own self narrative um, and their relationships. So we've been creating a lot of new little snippets and actually taking some other things back uh, from other songs and pulling them and. For example, the first song that Johanna wrote for the show is now actually two new songs. We've broken it apart, and there are two new songs out of that. Um, they still hold true to their original ideas, and, and, but they're conceptually now different, realized differently. Um, and one of the songs that we found for Cassandra was when she's up in space by herself. Because now we, we took her from... We didn't really know why Cassandra was chosen to go to Mars as well. Um, we knew she was Paolo's wife, but that was it in the original version. Mm -hmm. Now she's actually an astronaut as well. So we know right off the bat she's an astronaut, just like Paolo is, and that she's probably going to be on another mission following, because there are many missions that are going to happen. Paolo just happens to be the first one to be going. So now we've developed all that into the show. So now when she's up in space, all hell is breaking loose on Earth. And the song you just heard Nicole t sing, Night Bloom and Sirius, uh, is, is all about the fact that we have one little bit of life to live and to live it to the fullest in that little moment, right? It, but at the same time, we're also given chances and opportunities to do something greater than ourselves, right? And this song is about that moment of fully realizing that there's something greater than herself. And it's I Am Humanity. And um, I, I'm hoping that Johanna will sing it with Nicole. Yeah. And uh, Ray will play it with Peter.
song continues. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the cast? I mean, we've heard about this New York cast. Who do you have playing the leads? Well, our, our female lead, her name is Fantine. Check her out. She's actually fantastic. I would say that she's, in my opinion, possibly the next Beyonce. Yes. Um, she's yeah. a star in Europe and in the Dominican Republic. She's actually both Russian and Dominican, Dominican, right? And grew up in Australia. And she grew up in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, but she's amazing. Um, you could actually seriously check her out on her own uh, website, uh, Fantine. F a n t i n e music dot com. com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, she'll be playing the role of Cassandra. And then for our role of Paolo, uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Pepe. Um, and he's originally from Spain. And what's really funny about this is... Um, we wanted a Spaniard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Johanna originally thought of this role as being a Spanish person, right? And we were in the audition process, and Nicole and, and uh, Johanna and I were really upset because we weren't getting a lot of mail submissions that we were really feeling like that was a Paolo, you know? We got a lot of them that were really kind of humorous, a lot of very humorous things. <laughs> Um, and we, we finally went, well, we got to get more male submissions. So maybe we, maybe it's too Hispanic of a name. We got to change it. And we actually changed the name to Cruz, but it actually fits. Paolo Cruz works as his full name. Um, so we thought that would help us get more people, but the way we actually found him is pretty funny. Um, it's from one of the cast members that we cast in the show, um, she, we basically said, if you guys know anybody that knows a guy who can really sing and act and he's pretty good looking, that could look like an astronaut, have him give us a ring. And um, the next day, one of the girls in the cast said, I know somebody who's interested, but he's a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and we ended up doing a Skype audition with him. And uh, he was amazing. He was amazing. Yeah, he was he amazing. He was a rocker. We wanted a Latin rocker. And, and we got um, one. We got one. Yeah. And uh, so he's our Paolo. Our, um, our Madeline, you met. Our Madeline is Cassandra's best friend in the show. And we fully developed that character more. And now Madeline has a few more songs, too. And mm -hmm. in the original concept, there was only one thing that she really sang in. Um, but now she has a couple of other pieces that she sings in. She sings another duet and, uh, and a trio. Uh, one of the songs is now a trio. And um, so that's Nicole Palmer is our Madeline. Mm -hmm. And then our Hector is Corey Gibson. This man is a presence on stage. I cannot, I cannot even begin to tell you. Um, but he came in and he sang for us a cappella. Um, born, uh, what's the name? Oh, Chess. No, okay. no, he sang the, the shepherd song first, didn't he? The, uh, yeah. I was born by the river. He sang that a cappella for us. And we were all just like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. this guy's amazing. And then later he sang anthem for us. And that was, the, that was the closer. That just closed the door and we knew he was our Hector. And Hector's character originally in the original concept, he just sang one song and that was send off. And... Um, or now Mars. he's yeah yeah and he's and now he's, he's all over the place yeah and um he's, we've written three songs that he's involved in now are you singing um oh monuments? am i gonna try and do no monuments i can try no history will sing your praises going grace except what's coming and care for your families give them your love until the last one's alive no memories no monuments no history will 
sing their praises. They're heroes, and yet they go unsung. You're heroes, and yet you go unsung. But I know, yes, I know, you know what you've done, cause I know. Just look what you have done! Mars is a planet that uh, is all about, but it's also a person in this rock opera. How did that come to be that you decided to create a person for the planet Mars? It was Johanna's idea originally. I started thinking about Mars and the energy of Mars and the color of it, and I just thought flamenco dancer. It just seemed like we needed a flamenco dancer to embody that energy of Mars. So what if Mars had been laying dormant until we landed on it with our Mars landers? And that awoke. So she starts out the show first getting the first people to come. And then she approaches and she'll end up going after Cassandra as well and try to get life back, because she knows life comes from two people. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to cool see concept. that right now. Silence is deep, but then radio's down. There is no news from home. Last thing I heard, there was war breaking out. I could be left here alone. But she said not to go But I sought to face glory and love This is a planet, such a desolate place So there seems to be a strong Spanish connection here with uh, Paolo and the flamenco. Where's, where's some of the rock that, that's in this? But I, this one yeah. works. I mean, I, a lot of these songs I wrote on a 12-string guitar, and uh, I performed them on a 12-string guitar solo. But when you put the whole rock and roll band behind it... some more Just to have all eyes on me as my rocket shoots away I would do most anything to catch that ride again Nine miles high The way I feel tonight The earth keeps getting smaller yeah, I'm feeling nine miles high tonight Nine miles high I'm Flying like a kite Living out my destiny, I'm feeling nine miles high tonight. Ah! Yeah! Woo! And we got drums coming on crazy. <laughs> <and there's laughs> a you know, we get, I can, we get into it. <laughs> but there's actually a lot of that in the show as well, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really fun. I mean, uh, what's Last interesting to me has some yeah. of that to it as well. You know, you've got some songs that really are going to make people go out, want to dance. You yeah. know, one of the cool things about what I really enjoy about this this the trajectory of these songs is 
Paolo's music was all started with my rock and roll sensibility. He's just really cranking out there as he's taking off and he's getting out to space and he's Mars landing us. I finally landed here, you know, and, and he's all this celebratory stuff. But then he starts getting more and more like lonely and morose and like wondering about is there, you know, even that last song, Hope is Gone. What is the point of carrying on when, when hope is dwindling away? So he's getting into this really sad place. But then Cassandra comes in with Landing Day, and yeah, she's like... Last of my tribe as well. Last yeah. of my tribe. She gets from going these sort of soliloquies, ballad-type songs at the beginning to this just total rock kick butt songs. <laughs> But at the end, she's just so empowered when she comes in. Uh, no, and today is one of those things that we just played in the beginning, the very, yeah. the very beginning of the show. Yeah. Right? That's true. You played Landing Day at the be very beginning. Yeah. The very beginning, yeah. 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 So you heard that. Yeah. So um, now, somehow, NASA's involved. How did that happen, and what's really going on with this Explore Mars? When we thing? placed it, a, an audition uh, advertisement in the, in the online Backstage stuff, and, you know, yeah. that this guy from... Um, a company called Explore Mars. It's a nonprofit that convenes conferences and does research on all the stuff that's going on to get humans to Mars. So every year he puts a conference together, uh, bringing in NASA and Lockheed Martin and Boeing and uh, Orbital ATK and Aerojet and all these amazing, huge, huge companies that actually collaborate and work together on um, um, getting people to Mars, getting space exploration. He found this audition notice, contacted me, and introduced himself. And I'm thinking, right, you know, this cannot possibly be real. <laughs> and he says, but the conference is next week, and we'd like you to come down, and we'd like you to perform some of your music, and I'd like to introduce you to all these people. So I was down there hanging out with those <laughs> people from NASA and Lockheed Martin. And uh, or, uh, today, just... Oh, oh yeah, the yes. Scotch company. <laughs> come turn around. <laughs> One of the... the they yeah. they had me come and play for um, for this uh, <laughs> for a reception. <laughs> it was a reception hosted by Ardbeg Single Malt Whiskey, and I played that song. I just played. I played Nine Miles High. The microphone went out. I had no sound. They told I had to do it entirely um, acoustically. They told me they could hear me on the next floor down. Oh, <laughs> but they were very well lubricated too. So. <laughs> <laughs> and you also have an art installation involved with this project, right? Yeah, we're doing a science art fair uh, in concert with the show. Um, basically, we're going to be allowing at least 15 to 20 high school students. So high school students, if you'd like to be involved in this, you can. Um, you're not going to be charged. It's basically like a science space camp for a week where you're going to create an installation art piece. Basically, a Mars base camp. You're going to do research on what it takes for humans to live on Mars and create basically that, so that everybody can walk through before the show. Uh, the installation work will happen the week prior to, so all the research and STEAM work. So it's a STEAM project, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, and so there are teachers that will navigate and help these kids create a large art installation of a Mars base camp with hydroponics, telling you some of the things that you need to do when you're on Mars, you know, some graphics and stuff, some virtual reality possibly. Depends what the kids want to make. And then uh, everybody can visit that before they come into the theater for the show. Wow, so when people buy a ticket to this thing, they're going to get a lot more than just a, yeah. a rock opera. And we're, we're negotiating with um, some of these big companies right now. Um, there's one, I, I won't mention it right now, but there's one that <laughs> wants to send a virtual reality display uh, where you, I, I did this when I was in D.C., and it absolutely blew my mind. Um, you put on your goggles, and they put on earphones, and you're in a totally different environment. And then to turn, the, turn it on, and you're in a factory that's making space engines, the rocket engines. And you're in there, and you're looking around, and people are moving around doing stuff, and they're building it, and then they fire one off, and it's like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, so that kind of display, uh, we're, that's going to be at the show too. We're, well, we're planning on it. Oh, okay. Well, let's see what happens. Right now, as we're speaking, the tickets are on sale. Oh yeah, right at uh, operahouse.org. You can go right in there and buy them. And there's only four performances, so 
if people are watching this, they probably want to get tickets as soon as possible. August 24th, 25th, and 26th, we have evening shows. And then on Sunday, August 27th, we have a matinee at 2.30. At That's a Sunday, and then the other's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night yeah. performances. Yeah. And Waterville Opera House is an absolutely incredible facility. It's beautiful. It's, it's, um, state of the art. It is I mean. a state of the art theater. It's an 800 seat uh, theater with this absolutely gorgeous balcony and a full, huge stage. Comfortable um, seats. <laughs> it's important. And the Mars Bar. <laughs> we just coined that term today coming down. It's the Mars Bar, the lobby. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Serving beer and wine. Excellent. Excellent. So um, I think we're going out now with Space Journey. When I looked outside my window, I was floating there in space. The earth was small and lapis blue. I felt so full of grace. There were shooting stars beneath me and auroras dancing lights. The cities in my distant home glowed through the darkness of the night. I can see them. 